Hi, everybody. Um, I am going to talk about social emotional development in uh, middle adulthood uh, in this um, in this video lecture. Um, and of course, you'll be reading about more about middle adulthood in the chapters in the book, but I'm going to focus on a particular area in the lecture of social emotional development which is um, different perspectives that um, uh, various theorists, prominent theorists have on adjustment in midlife. What uh, kinds of things have they said about factors that influence whether or not the uh, individual is having a fulfilling time uh, during that um, period, uh, period of development? Um, so, let me, um, I'll go back and forth between uh, me on the screen and then also uh, sharing the screen, which has the PowerPoint uh, with the major uh, issues I'm gonna cover. And this is already on online for you. So, um, so here we are and um, I uh, just want to mention in starting is that um, since emerging adulthood, we've been um, placing the time parameters for each of the adult stages, um, you know, giving two choices. The first one would be it starts uh, at 40 and goes to 60, which is the traditional manner, in which case the time that's carved out from early adulthood to make room for emerging adulthood, that is um, up to uh, through age 25, would um, be an emerging adulthood, and then early adulthood would go from uh, 45 to 65. But if we just uh, keep it um, at the other option of 40 to 60, uh, early adulthood would just be a, a shorter a phase. So whether we consider middle adulthood 40 to 60, or 45 to 65 hasn't quite been uh, worked out um, as the same issue we faced in early adulthood. But it's in that area, the 40s and uh, the 50s and perhaps even the uh, first part of the, of the 60s. So that's the time frame that we're uh, working on. And, um, and we're focusing on social de emotional development within that time frame and in particular, as I mentioned, four perspectives on what it means to have a fulfilling life or to be well adjusted uh, in this uh, middle phase uh, of adulthood. So we're gonna go through uh, four theories and then the rest of the uh, information on the stage will be through the uh, book chapters uh, that you've been assigned. Um, so the first perspective is a perspective put forth by a man named Carl Jung and his concept of individuation. Now of the four perspectives, in a way this is the least currently important. That is, it's, it's not talked about as much in contemporary research and theory and development. And so you might ask like, well, why am I, you know, um, uh, talking about it, and it's because there, there's some benefit uh, to it, um, even today, but also it has tremendous historical and somewhat unrecognized significance in the history of um, uh, uh, adult perspectives uh, in development. And because this is an academic class, uh, as well as having applied aspects of it, I really want you to know um, about this concept that Jung put forth on individuation and why it's sort of historically uh, significant. All right, so let me go back here and just talk with you. So um, Carl Jung was the heir apparent to the throne of psychoanalysis that Sigmund Freud uh, developed. Um, Sigmund Freud, and, and he, he picked, he anointed, if you will, Carl Jung for this role 
um, for a, a couple of different reasons. And um, one was that Jung was brilliant uh, and Freud recognized Jung's brilliance. And the second reason was that um, Jung didn't, wasn't uh, a, a Jew who lived in the Viennese um, ghetto um, of Austria. Um, all of the early, all of Freud and his, the sort of early disciples of psychoanalysis came from a very small community uh, in Vienna. Uh, toward the late 19th century and early 20th century. And, um, and in fact, in, the, in those early days, psychoanalysis was called the Jewish science because of uh, the people who, like Freud, who put, put it forth for the first time. And Freud had, you know, um, much larger uh, aspirations than it just being... Um, confined to Vienna and also to his um, uh, religious uh, group. He wanted it to be something that influenced uh, psychology across the entire continent of Europe and, and even beyond. And he felt that in order to do that, he had to break out of Vienna and also break out of the Jewish nature uh, of psychoanalysis. And so Jung was a Gentile a non-Jew who lived in Zurich, Switzerland. And those factors combined with uh, Jung's brilliance led Freud to focus on him as the person who would carry the torch um, of psychoanalysis, you know, when Freud himself couldn't, wasn't able to do that. Um, and reflective of this, uh, when Freud came to the United States, to give his new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis at Clark University uh, outside of Boston. Um, he took one person with him on his um, cruise across the Atlantic to give these lectures, and that was Carl Jung. So he was introducing Jung to the wider world as part of this um, uh, ambition to uh, extend psychoanalysis to the, um, to the wider human culture, which he ultimately succeeded upon, but, but um, not through Jung, because that uh, plan failed for several reasons. The most critical reason it failed is that Jung deviated from Freud in his definition or understanding of what we call libido, uh, which is psychological energy, the force that propels us and drives us. It's our libido. Now to Freud, libido, he was a strict um, a physicalist and he saw libido in very much in physical terms, that libido was sexual energy, and it was aggressive energy, just like an animal. Sex and aggression were the driving uh, force, you know, in, in Freud's theory. And he felt that all libido was sexual and aggressive in nature. And Jung, in, the, in, the, in a great theoretical heresy, said that, yes, libido is uh, composed of sexual energy, and it's composed of aggressive energy, but there's also a metaphysical or a spiritual component to the energy that drives people. And Freud, as one of history's great, um, most well-known atheists or agnostics, um, thought that this was a completely um, unacceptable um, revision or extension of his theory. He, he wanted to have no, um, he wanted to have no um, metaphysical uh, properties in his theory. And ultimately Freud and um, Jung never um, healed that division 
related to this fundamental difference about the nature of human energy and libido. But there was a second divide, less essential, but also important and very applicable to our work in developmental psychology, a second division between Freud and, um, and Jung. And that is that Freud was really a kind of radical early experience person. He believed that character was largely set in the first five years of life, in the, in, um, in the stages that we would call uh, infancy, toddlerhood, and early uh, childhood. He felt that these were the main areas that um, character and personality to, were set. And, um, and so there, there was this um, real focus on early development and on child development. And after um, early childhood, while there was some opening in personality, obviously you wouldn't have any need for therapy if it was completely closed to plasticity and change. Um, the level of openness and change after early childhood, in Freud's view, was, was somewhat restricted. And that's why therapy had to be long-term and intensive. But here comes, um, here comes along, you know, Jung, and says that, yes, uh, I agree that the most influential and formative years uh, of a person's life, the greatest contribution to their personality and their character are the earliest phases of development. I agree with you, Freud. But I believe that the level of plasticity, the level of openness to change is wider than you proposed. And in fact, this openness remains well into adulthood that we still have the capacity, even without intensive therapy, to, to grow and to develop and to change um, our personality. And no one had ever said that before. So in a way, Jung was the first one to introduce the, the um, perspective of adulthood and aging within lifespan, within development. Development used to be about childhood. And then he was the first one to introduce the possibility of adult development as a significant uh, area of change. Now, he's not credited with being the father of lifespan development. As you know from class, Erickson's the spine of this class. Erickson is the theorist who is given credit for inventing the, or discovering or, or initiating the perspective of a lifespan, not just a child and adolescent view of development. Um, he's considered the originator of human development and lifespan development, which we're teaching, which I'm teaching, and you're learning about in class. And so Jung has gotten lost in the shuffle. And the reason is that because Erickson has a grand theory, he puts everything together in a comprehensive way. And Jung, just had one idea, but it pertained to adult development. He never, he never developed it into a full-fledged integrated approach. And so that's one of the reasons that we study Erickson as a lifespan theorist and not, um, not Jung. But anyway, um, the, the concept, let's go back to the screen share here. The concept that Jung put forth was called individuation. What does that mean? Well, um, individuation uh, means that, um, in Jung's mind, is that in the first half of our life, let's say the first approximately 40 years of our life, we are dominated by um, demands of external adaptation. Think of all the things that we have to do in our first half of our life. We have to grow, we have to develop, we have to develop physical skills, we have to develop cognitive and academic skills, learning language, learning to read, learning to write. We need to develop 
social emotional skills of communication and interaction with with other people um, we eventually have to uh, bring all that learning together to develop uh, to get a job and to develop a career and a and a path forward in life maybe to find a, a life partner to start our own family to raise children you know these are an incredible number of requirements that we have um, in the first half of our life. And so Jung said that in the process of taking care of all these external things, we may not pay attention to certain aspects of ourselves. We may not develop aspects of ourselves. But then in the second half of life, as the requirements of external adaptation become less, we begin to look inward and we may say, you know what? There are parts of me that I haven't explored. There are parts of me that I always wanted to develop. And you know, I'm gonna pay attention to those more than I have in the past. I'm gonna develop these lost aspects of the self, these unattended to aspects of the self, and try to become a fuller human being, a more, more of a complete individual. And that's what he meant by individuation. So the succinct definition, you know, would be the uh, process of integrating aspects of the self that had been lost or undeveloped in the crush of external requirements of the first half of your life. And in integrating those lost or undeveloped aspects of the self, one becomes more complete and more of a full individual. It's wonderful. So let's say, you know, as an example of this, let's say, you know, somebody had devoted their entire life to taking care of other people. You know, let's say a, a mom or a parent who, whose sole objective or dominant objective was to take care of other people, to nurture them, to socialize them, and that there were hobbies and interests and, 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 and business opportunities and talents that they hadn't developed enough. And that somewhere in midlife and beyond, in the 40s and 50s, they began to reclaim and investigate those kinds of things and become more of an individual. Or somebody who did the reverse, that was very ambitious, career-oriented, um, 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 maybe uh, um, trying to earn a lot of money, trying to really compete in the world, and really hadn't developed their inner life or attended to the social relationships in their life to the level they want. And then, and then at some point they said, you know what, I, I haven't, I missed this, I'm not complete. And they try to focus on it and bring those aspects into their life and become a more complete, whole and individuated uh, human being. Okay, so it's, um, it's not something that we pay attention to that much because of the fact that it's just one concept. But I want you to know it's the first concept anyone ever introduced in the modern era of psychology that pertain to the capacity and the possibility of significant changes in adulthood. And in some ways was a precursor to the whole lifespan uh, um, perspective that Eric Erickson uh, developed and is so influential uh, in our class. So I want you to at least know that concept. The other reason I have to say was uh, that Jung's idea of individuation is not talked about that much was his unfortunate, you know, choice of words because the concept of individuation, if you ask any psychologist, they, if you say individuation, what does it bring to mind? They won't say Jung because there are two other processes in development that are incredibly important to modern psychology that have the word individuation in it. One of them 
uh, is, is with the, uh, uh, your stage of development, which is a transition from being an adolescent to uh, gradually, you know, um, uh, separating from your family to some extent. You're still part of a family and they're still meaningful to you, but becoming a separate human being and a separate person with your own ideas and your own directions apart from your family of origin as you, as you move through emerging adulthood and early adulthood. And that process, you know, I think uh, you've heard is called individuation from the family of origin. Okay, that coming of age process is individuation from the family of origin. That's a big deal. We spent a lot of time talking about that. And then secondly, the process of, of when a baby is carried by, by the mother, the baby is, is in a symbiotic, parasitic relationship to the mother's body. They're one bio system. And then the baby's born and the umbilical cord is cut and the baby is physically separated from the mother. But the baby has to figure out, this is a new thing here. The baby has to figure out how to survive physically, but also how they're separate or how they're together from the mother, given that they're no longer one holistic system. They're two separate human beings. And that process of what the baby finds out how they are related to the mother, but separate to the mother, both physically and psychologically, is called the separation individuation process in early development, which is hugely significant in contemporary uh, psychology. So poor Jung picked the wrong word and he got all crowded out linguistically uh, and I think that's another reason that we don't talk as much about uh, his ideas. Okay, now let's go on to the second <clears throat> major perspective. And here we return to our grand theorist, uh, Eric Erickson, and his um, psychosocial conflict or issue of midlife, the central psychosocial issue of midlife to Erickson is generativity versus stagnation. So let me stop the share and talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so the uh, definition of generativity um, is the concern with um, the uh, making a contribution to future generations. Okay, so generativity pertains to an outlook, a psychological perspective that you want to, to um, contribute to future generations in a constructive kind of way. All right. Now, when Erickson first wrote about generativity and making a contribution to future generations as a an important psychological um, uh, process uh, in midlife, he uh, was misconstrued and seen, and generativity was viewed in a, a very narrow way as uh, raising, uh, raising children. Now certainly raising children um, is a generative act. You are literally creating the new generation, and then guiding the new generation. So um, a commitment to try to be a good parent is a generative act. But um, Erickson is quick to point out that generativity is a much broader set of options than just raising children. You, you don't have to have children, and you could still be highly generative. Think of all the things that you could do and all the occupations and all the things that you could do to make a contribution to future generations. If you volunteer in some um, uh, way that uh, protects 
the environment, an ecological cause. That makes a contribution for physical gen for future generations, because obviously if we don't have a planet, they're not going to do very well, um, floating out in space somewhere. Um, the um, uh, getting involved in political causes so that you can, might shape uh, public policy in a way that you think would be uh, positive for future generations, whatever they might be. Getting involved in your uh, communities, uh, serving um, on a community agency, on a, bo on a, a board of directors, on um, um, being a council person. Uh, teaching, I think, is a generative act in that you share the accumulated knowledge and wisdom that you have with younger people in an effort to um, enhance their understanding and their path forward you know, in life. If you're a member of a religious group or a clergy, for example, that could be seen as something that is generative. Uh, to create a work of art, um, a work of science, a work of literature, a work of cinema, all these things are ways of contributing and enhancing future generations. So you can see it's a huge um, uh, catch-all for many positive things that you can do um, that, that Erickson was talking about. So that's one competing social orientation that goes on. The, um, the antithesis, the opposite, of generativity is stagnation. And stagnation is when you get locked in in midlife, where you perpetuate the more personal and present oriented focus of an adolescent and an emerging adult. Now, emerging adult. Now, remember. In adolescence, the, 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 the developing child is trying to create a sense of self, a sense of identity. In emerging adulthood, they're experimenting with relationships, with work, with, with places to live, with different experiences to, to test out possibilities and ideas um, that will um, 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 move them forward in life and then have them ultimately settle down and take a direction. So it's an age of self-exploration, of self-discovery, and that's all fine. Now, it gets clouded because some of you, many of you, especially within LMU, which is so committed to social uh, service and um, social justice and these kinds of things, you may be doing things that are gener generative and have some of that in your life already. Um, uh, in high school, you do service education. So it's not that these things don't occur early in development, but it becomes a more pressing dominant need. And in earlier development, in adolescence and in emerging adulthood, even if you're doing uh, work for others, being in the service of others, the dominant thing is to find out who you are and to learn about possibilities in your life as opposed to the dominant focus, is to give back, is to guide, okay? Because you don't have enough experience. You're, you're in the taking in process, being a sponge in life. But, but eventually, you need to take that experience and give it back, hopefully in a constructive way. And people who don't, who stay locked into self-absorption um, and, and, and uh, uh, um, and, and the present, just present pleasure and self-absorption. Things that are fine in youth uh, are seen as a kind of stagnation. All right? Now, with all the stages in Erickson's model, um, ultimately it's not either generativity or stagnation, but it's a ratio of these two uh, orientations to life. And in Erickson's view, to the extent that generativity and not being locked into the present and not being locked into the self, but being more open to, to the future and contributing to the future 
and things that are larger than yourself, that this will be a place of satisfaction as opposed to stagnation and present orientation dominating. All right, so we have Jung and individuation, and we have Erickson on generativity versus stagnation. Now we move on to a very interesting uh, theoretician by the name uh, of Peck. And Peck uh, has, hold on a second, uh, what he calls four developmental transitions of midlife and beyond. Now, uh, I have to explain this to you. So each of the transitions, these four developmental transitions that occur in midlife um, are not exclusive to midlife. They begin in midlife and they continue till the end of development. So they, four of them, they begin in midlife and they continue to be issues throughout development. Now, when we get into late adulthood and you read about uh, late adulthood, you'll re-encounter Peck and you'll find that he has four more developmental transitions that kick in in the 60s and beyond. So, so there's two things, there's four, in midlife that keep going, and then four more that kick in in late adulthood and they all go to the end. So don't get confused, there are eight in total, and these are the four that begin and from midlife and continue on. The first one, um, excuse me, I went too far. The first one <clears throat> is valuing wisdom versus physical or material characteristics. Wisdom versus physical or material characteristics. Um, let, me, let me do a, a quick aside. Um, I don't know if any of you have taken um, social psychology. Uh, all of you who are psych majors will have to, it's a requirement, uh, for your uh, degree in psychology to take a course in social psychology, okay? Um, some of you may have done that, some of you will be taking that at a later point. But if you studied social psychology, um, or whenever you study social psychology, you'll learn about an important process called social comparison theory. And what's, what social comparison theory says is that human beings are, in, in, in trying to understand themselves and to understand their value, have to compare themselves to other people. That there's no absolute sense of worth or value that human beings have independent of comparing themselves to others. So that is, your value as a person is not absolute, it's relative to how you perceive yourself vis-a-vis -vis other people, all right? That's the basis of social comparison in general. Now, there are three ba primary bases of comparison that human beings use to evaluate their worth or value relative to others. One is their physical appearance and physical skills. So the physical dimension is a dimension of social comparison. Do I look nice compared to other people? Do I think I'm average or above average or exceptional on a physical level? or not? Where do I position myself, compare myself to others on a physical dimension? Secondly, there's the material um, or resource dimension, which is how do I compare to other people in my comparison group um, with respect to my uh, material uh, resources and other resources. So this would be 
you know, um, your standard of living, all of your achievements, your uh, status uh, symbols, your status attainments. So it could be your degrees, it could be your um, economic stature, all these sort of material power acquisition status kinds of elements that um, you know people people have okay um, then the um, then the last basis is you can compare yourself based upon your internal development, your sense of wisdom, your sense of knowledge, your character, and compare that to other people, okay? So, so it's physical, it's uh, material resources and status, and it's internal variables like wisdom and knowledge and emotional development and character. All right, so these are the three, and these operate, uh, okay, so, so here we are, we're developmental psychologists, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna study this uh, concept per se. We're interested, as developmental students, we're interested not in just social comparison, but how social comparison changes over time. How is social comparison different for children, for adolescents, for adults, for late adults? How does it vary versus stages? So what Peck said was, all of these areas of social comparison exist at all stages of development. For example, children. Children certainly can evaluate themselves physically, whether they think they can do things physically that, you know, like other kids can do or better than other kids can do. They could determine whether they think they look good compared to other kids. Is their weight, is their physical appearance, all these kinds of physical dimension, children are quite aware of that. Secondly, children are aware of who um, has social stature, whose um, families have more. They see what cars parents come up in. They see what houses they you know, live in what kind of clothes they, you know, have. Children, you know, live in this culture and they pick up on the social divisions um, between, uh, between individuals at an early stage. And they also know who are, quote, nice kids or good kids or trustworthy kids and who are the bad kids. They have a sense of character and the sense of the internal life of the other kids. So all these work and they start at the beginning and they keep going. But the dominant basis of social comparison for young people, and I would put adolescence in there, is the physical domain. I mean the physical dimension even though they all operate. And then once you get your degree and you get out there in the big bad world, issues of status, issues of achievement, issues of what you accomplish in life become a somewhat more dominant and bigger element of how you compare yourself. Now, as you begin to get into midlife, and accelerating for the uh, remainder of life, the physical level begins to decline somewhat, okay? As you get older, you're just not as, um, in as, uh, as strong, as physically developed, you begin to age, these kinds of things. That's the way it all goes. And you also get you know, closer to the end of your life and you begin to question whether issues of status and acquisition are quite as important as the more internal dimensions of your life and of other people. So what this means is that the basic progression in the dominant mode of social comparison starts with the physical, moves into 
acquisition, status, social position, and ultimately moves into internal character. This is, this is if you're well adjusted. I mean, you could be obsessed with making every dime you can make for the rest of your life, or you can be obsessed with your physical appearance until, until late adulthood. What he's saying is that the normative progression and the progression of a, a well-adjusted life usually goes from the physical to the acquisition status to the internal level. And that's good for older people because it's harder certainly to compete on the physical level and um, and you have to kind of let go on that a little bit and focus more on the thing that you are advantaged given your experience, which is the internal kind of life. The great um, um, anthropologist and theologian and writer Joseph Campbell once said that older people have to make the transition from valuing physical prowess and things to valuing wisdom. Or as he once beautifully said, you have to learn to value the light instead of the light bulb, which I think summarizes this, this uh, very well. So anyway, Peck sensitizes us to people, as people getting older, the, the advantage of moving into the development of character and wisdom as the central way that they compare themselves and evaluate themselves with other people and position themselves in the world. And that is a source that they can compete and that they can be satisfied. Now, the next concept that he uh, has um, is called socializing versus sexualizing in relationships. And uh, obviously, you know, when you're younger and you're in these uh, stages um, um, of reproduction, a lot of energy and focus in your life in early adolescence, adolescence, emerging adulthood, early adulthood is gonna be related to sexuality, and, um, uh, and reproduction. These issues will be dominant considerations. But as people get older, they can, they can uh, try to continue with that primary perspective, or as often happens, the companionship, the intimacy, the closeness, the friendship that people present, the support, becomes more of a dominant um, emphasis in relationships than pure sexuality. Now, this is not to say that sexuality is eliminated as an important process, and people can continue to have a satisfying sexual life well into midlife and even into their senior years. The point is that psychologically, that becomes less of a dominant focus. Um, now, interestingly, I'm gonna factor in contextual development because even though starting in, uh, in midlife, when uh, people historically um, were not reproducing as much and hormones and um, uh, uh, become um, uh, diminished and women go through menopause and all the whole reproductive physical aspect, you know, begins to change, it would naturally lead to less physical um, uh, and psychological focus on sexuality. But now in the new context, at least for men, you know, that they have pharmacological aids to sexual uh, potency and sexual vitality, such as um, Vi Viagra and Cialis and all these uh, kinds of um, uh, medications, um, 
that the male at least is able to continue their sexual activity well into you know their life longer than um, uh, typically was possible generations ago and um, so contextually uh, there is the possibility of extending a dominant focus on sexuality um, even though from an emotional point of view and psychological point of view Peck is saying that despite that possibility uh, the shift to the more social emotional intimate connected companionship elements that relationships uh, bring um, are a, a greater source of satisfaction and meaning to people as they uh, get older. Now an interesting uh, sidelight, because I did mention the sort of uh, sexual uh, revolutionary impact of, of medications like Viagra and Cialis for men, that the, there's been a lot of research and development to see if there could be the development of a quote unquote female uh, Viagra. And um, this has been a dismal failure. Um, there was a drug that was um, called Intrinza, I think, that was briefly approved by the FDA um, at an early stage of testing uh, as enhancing uh, sexual desire and pleasure in older women, but uh, ultimately in, in physical testing it was just shown to be a brief uh, placebo uh, and didn't really have much of an effect. And this is because the reason it's been so difficult in terms of finding some sort of uh, support or aid to sexual uh, desire and pleasure in older women, um, uh, mainly postmenopausal women, um, has been because the sexuality of females, for the most part, is much more complex, um, both in terms of the sexual system and then also the cultural or, or biological, it's always debated, uh, a connection between um, uh, emotions and psychology and, 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 and physical aspects of sexuality for women than for many, for many men. Um, of course, there are exceptions to this. And so even though there's a lot of research going on with the pharmacology companies knowing that if they were to succeed in developing uh, a kind of female Viagra, and we're talking about, you know, a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar uh, industry. So there's a lot of people trying to do this. Um, it's been a failure. Um, now for men, it's been a success because the male system, both psychologically, emotionally, and physically, you know, is um, so much simpler. It's really just a simple um, hydraulic uh, system, which is where um, you dilate the blood vessels, uh, including the blood vessels uh, in the penis. Blood rushes into the penis, the penis gets larger, erect, and the person is able to have sex. That's all it really is. Again, for women, it's much more uh, complicated. But regardless of the context, regardless of all these uh, pharmacological innovations um, uh, in, in our world now that were never there before, Peck would hold uh, to his point that whatever is possible physically, that the movement into uh, prioritizing the social emotional aspects of relationships versus the purely sexual ones uh, is a key component in uh, satisfaction in these stages of development. All right, the third uh, one that Peck talked about is mental flexibility versus mental rigidity. And let me um, talk a little bit about uh, this to you. So uh, mental flexibility is that when people go through the coming of age period, that's the period where they become their own person, that a member of a family, 
but also separate from the family, influenced by the family, but having their own ideas, their own code of conduct, their own values, their own directions in life, okay? When the, uh, in the process of that becoming and coming of age, people generally develop a worldview. That worldview may be uh, composed of different aesthetic preferences. For example, what kind of music you think is great, what kind of music you like, what kinds of movies and television shows that you valued. Um, you may, it may also extend to things that are related to, you know, do you, um, um, what value do you have of children, of families? What are your political views? What are your values? What do you believe in? You come, um, you have a worldview, a way it's supposed to work, a way you're supposed to live, okay? And at that point, you, you have a good view. Now that view is going to be, um, you're gonna have that. Now what's gonna happen is, that later on, as the world changes and new generations rise into new contexts, they're going to have different viewpoints, different political viewpoints, different social viewpoints, and that these things are different aesthetic viewpoints, different viewpoints of the way you're supposed to live. And a certain number of people will be mentally rigid and they'll think like, wow, these young kids are like off their rocker. They're like, this is, everything's falling apart. This is the decline of Western civilization. I mean, imagine if you were an adult, let's say one of your parents or grandparents, and you felt that like beautiful music, you know, was that the, you know, that it, it was only like the Beatles or, you know, um, uh, God knows what, you know, I mean, the Beatles are, are timeless and incredible, but, but it doesn't mean that's the only form of, of music. And it doesn't mean that new forms of music that have emerged, you know, from, 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 um, from uh, even the disco era and then to rap and hip hop and electronica, you know, all these things that parents, some parents look at this and they think, oh my God, you know, this, this isn't music, you know, this is noise. This is, this is like, what, what, is, what, are these, what are these people like? And they're, you know, piercing themselves and they're putting on, you know, tats all over the place and wearing pants that are falling down and all these aesthetic, you know, decisions and, odd hairdos and everything. The world is falling apart, okay? And some, you know, uh, most of the kids in Western Europe are not getting married. They're, they're having, you know, just agreements and, and uh, to live together and to commit to each other. And they have babies, you know, outside of marriage and people feel like this is, you know, life falling apart. And if you have a rigid sense that the way you think that the world should work is some objectively ordained way that the world is supposed to be, and believe you me, many people do, then you are bound to be really, really upset and confused and, um, Feel that the world is falling apart if you have that rigidity. But if you believe that the view that you came up with during your coming of age period made sense for the period of time in history that you came of age, then and that you respect other generations for putting things together in a way that makes sense for their time in history, 
then you're not so threatened by change. You're not frightened by it. And you're not put off by the behaviors and values and orientations of other people. Okay? Peck is saying that if you have mental rigidity, it's going to be a challenge because our lives are spinning uh, very quickly. Oh, I'll give you one. I'll give you another example. This probably comes uh, straight to home, which is uh, the way you study. Now, it used to be back in the dark ages, um, you know, like uh, 20 years ago, um, 30 years ago, that when uh, young people were studying, they would, you know, go in their room and they'd crack a book and they would study and they take their notes and that's what they do. All right. Now, you know, you go into the room, you know this, of a teenager, or a young adult, and, um, you know, what you might see is a book open, maybe, um, and, um, but you'll also see, you know, computer screen and maybe five or six windows, including your social media feeds and Wikipedia and, you know, a bunch of other things that you might be following or looking at. Um, and you might have, you know, the TV on and you might have music playing and you'll have your uh, cell phone, okay? So you're like, you know, the hub of an entire, you know, web of uh, digital and, and, and uh, analog inputs. And of course, if a parent comes in and says, you know, why aren't you studying? And you look at them like they're from Mars and say, I am studying. This is how people study, okay? You know, could you please leave me alone, all right? Um, and, you know, a rigid parent will go like, you know, this, this, this is like, you know, impossible. And the flexible one might say, well, you know, this is a world where we have unprecedented amount of information and digital inputs. And there's something adaptive about being able to manage and multitask multiple inputs. And I just need to also teach this young child how to like stop and focus and focus on one thing now, now and then and be a balanced person. But I understand what they're doing and they're just adapting to a different kind of set of cultural conditions. So the second, in the second case, the parent is not feeling like life is falling apart. They feel like life is evolving and changing in dramatic ways, different than their own, maybe ways that they'll never be able to fully participate in. But um, their job is to use their wisdom and, and uh, values to guide the person in this new world that they have constructed and are adapting to, all right? And many of you, because now it's very easy, you're on, you think you're on the cutting edge of society and the way you do things, right? But you don't even have any idea of like, um, you know, how the world is changing and how a kid's 12, 13 years of age are changing. Like, like, like let's say, you know, um, uh, one generation was on Facebook and MySpace and then your generation, for the most part, I guess, uh, would be more uh, Instagram. Some people are on Twitter and this kind of thing. But like younger kids, I mean, if you are on, you know, Instagram, you're considered like, you know, a dinosaur. You know, they, they want to be on like TikTok or something. That's their thing. And um, so, so in, in every dimension, from digital technology to aesthetics to philosophy, to behavior, it's all going to be different. Don't be surprised, you know, if your kid wants you, uh, the way you agitated for a, a smartphone when you're probably too young to even get one, uh, but you agitated because everybody was getting one and you had to have that and you have to, you know, it's like an arm, another appendage. You know, maybe your kids will want like a, a subcutaneous internet enabled chip put in their brain. They don't want to carry a cell phone. They want to be able to like, uh, you know, connect with uh, the internet and search the internet through thought alone and auditory inputs and visual inputs would go into the auditory and vis um, uh, video cortex, visual cortex of the brain. And you'll say like, that's crazy. That's, that's, that's insane. The world is falling apart. You're turning into a cyborg, not a child, you know, and they'll look at you and go like, I'm not carrying that stupid phone around. Like, like, 
are, are you from like, you know, ancient Egypt or something? So be prepared. You'll face that. I guarantee you faster than you think because the world is already passing you by. Go to the mall and you know, the mall's closed, but go anywhere where eventually kids who are 11 and 12 are congregated and see if they're the same as you are or they're in a whole nother direction, okay? All right, speaking of another direction, how do you like that segue? Uh, let's go back to this. And the last one I'm gonna talk about in PEC is cathectic flexibility versus cathectic impoverishment. Now that's a mouthful. Let me deconstruct this for you. Cathectic flexibility uh, means um, that, well, cathexis means to attach your emotional energy to different people, places, and activities and things. Basically to attach your, you, your energy to nouns, people, places, things, and activities. Um, so uh, you have a certain amount of energy and you attach it, you connect it to certain people in your life, your friends, your family, uh, lovers, partners, okay? So that's people. Places might be a community, it might be a dorm, it might be um, a neighborhood, it might be a place where you hang out. There are places that you connect to and are part of you and part of your energy. Um, um, it may be activities and clubs you belong to or sports you play or um, all these things, okay? So you have a whole set of things that you attach your psychological energy to. What happens starting in midlife is you begin to lose these attachments. Maybe sometime in midlife, you begin to work less, you know, like toward the end. Maybe people in your life, um, your grandparents now, maybe they pass away. Maybe people retire and move away. Maybe people get injured or an illness or something. And you lose those things because, oh, hold on a second. I think we're about to run out. I'm gonna stop this and finish it in the second video. Oh no. Okay, no, I was able, for some reason, the screen um, was, it just went away for a second. All right, um, anyway, we are still in business here. So the, uh, so the, you have this cathetic, so what Peck pointed out is that these losses, uh, these losses of things that you connected to, that you invested in in your life, that as you get older, you begin to lose them. Now the question is, how do you respond to those losses? Some people have what he calls cathetic flexibility, which means if you lose something, you re you're able to reinvest that energy in something else. So for example, let's say you retire and you're not working anymore. Can you invest in new hobbies and activities and give your all to that? Or, okay, if you have friends that move away, can you make new friends? excuse me, if you um, uh, move away to, your, in, to another community on your own, can you get involved in that new community? All that means cathetic flexibility. And he felt that that is a great resource and a determinant 
in the lives of many people about whether or not they will be satisfied and happy. Um, the opposite of this is cathectic, is cathectic impoverishment, which means that some people, when they lose the things that they're invested in, they can't reinvest. Now, everybody stops reinvesting at a certain point because at some point in development, you just can't do it anymore. If you knew that every relationship, every person you got close to got sick or um, uh, senile or moved away or died, how many times could you give your heart? How many times could you reinvest? Tommy Lasorda, the old manager of the Dodger baseball team, once said that the best definition of getting old is for two consecutive years, you go to more funerals than weddings. Great operational definition. But it's that idea that, that you're gonna lose things. And it's part of life and part of development. And if you have that ability to reinvest, you will be happier. And, and no one knows, there's no prediction to who has cathetic flexibility and who doesn't. Remember earlier in the year, I talked to you about kids who are resilient children and can fashion a constructive life, even in the face of uh, uh, significant developmental threats. And that was such a blessing for them to have that resilience? Well, cathectic flexibility is kind of the older person's version of resilience. That in the face of loss, they can keep reinvesting, keep investing in life, keep finding new things to give themselves to in a hopeful and courageous way. But at some point, for most people, they run out. So I wish you, all, when you get older, a lot of cathetic flexibility because it's the platinum of older, of older age and enjoyment in older age. Um, okay, the last, the final midlife perspective on midlife adjustment is by a guy by the name of Daniel Levinson. Uh, let me go back to our screen and show, oh, it's, I see, it's, that's off. We, that's what we lost. We lost the screen. So I'm just going to say it to you. It's Daniel Levinson, who was a professor at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, professor of developmental psychology. And he uh, set out to do a, one of the most ambitious longitudinal studies in the history of psychology, where he, would, he wanted to study a cohort of men from their 20s all the way through their 60s. Okay, so over 40 years. He devoted his entire life to this because he wanted to create a theory of adult masculine development. And so he got a big cohort of men, uh, which at the time was fairly diverse because New Haven's a fairly diverse community, uh, ethnically, culturally, uh, in terms of uh, social class. Um, so he got this very diverse sample and at, at uh, junctures each decade, he and his uh, students and, and uh, uh, collaborators would throw the book at them in terms of psychological um, uh, measures. They'd study every dimension they possibly could and they interviewed them and they did everything. And then they tried to see if they could find a theory of how the lives of these men um, uh, changed and, and developed. And he failed because he didn't come up with a, a theory of, of masculine development, but he did succeed in coming up with some uh, interesting observations about the development of all adults, uh, men and women, um, that uh, has had some cultural uh, impact, okay? Um, 
I should mention to you that his work um, inspired a number of things. One was an old uh, best-selling book called Seasons of a Man's Life and a more, um, more popular book called Passages that really was influenced by his work. And um, even more notably, there is a, a series of films called Seven Up, which some film um, critics have called the most ambitious film project in, in all of history. And it was based on Levinson's work. And what it was is they, some British filmmakers uh, got a cohort of seven-year-olds in the, I think in the London area. It was years and years ago. And they did interviews and observations with these kids and their families when they were seven. And every seven years since then, they would find as many of these kids as possible. And, and for those who agreed to be evaluated, um, they would continue, they'd do another interview and evaluation session. And that was called 14 up. And then they did 21 up and 28 up. I think they're up to like 49 or 56 up. The original director died and the assistant director is now carrying on the work. So this is a film series that has gone on for something like 42 to 49 years. It's, you know, some of, this, some of the uh, subjects have passed away. Um, and it's just an incredible film project that um, looks at the lives of, looks at development, but from a cinematic as opposed to an academic, psychological, and research, uh, quantitative research perspective. But I urge you all to uh, uh, take a glance at this uh, Up series. And I'm sure most of them are up on uh, Netflix or Prime or something like that, definitely available uh, for free. And if you go to Wikipedia, you'll find out which one. I don't know if the last one was 49. I think it's probably 49 in there looking to do 56 um, soon. Okay, but I'm not sure, may, they may have even done 56. Okay, so um, anyway, this uh, Levinson, getting back to Levinson, he had this idea of uh, transition uh, points in development. And his idea was that every movement into a new stage of adult development is a complicated transition. So we've studied so far one of the great uh, complex transitions in adulthood, which is the merger from adolescence into early adulthood. And how complicated that is and how much change goes on in that time. Now what Levinson is noted for is he said that there's also a major transition that occurs at the end of early adulthood, 40, 45 in that area, into the movement into middle adulthood. And that he called the midlife transition but everybody knows it as the midlife crisis. That was not the terminology that he used. He said a midlife transition because it really doesn't have to be negative or positive. It can go in both ways, just like the transition into adulthood could be positive or not. Why don't we call it the early adult crisis? Why do we call it the early adult transition? And why do we call it the, in popular culture, the midlife crisis when Levinson called it the midlife transition? The reason is the media. The media felt that midlife transition was too boring. Okay, it had to be dramatic to get people to pay attention to it. So they called it the midlife crisis and focused in all the things that could go wrong 
you know, in this transition. Instead of looking at it as a transition where things could go right, things could go wrong, and all points in between. So, um, what is the midlife transition? We know that the early adult transition is the movement into becoming your own person, as we've described many times, not a dependent adolescent or rebellious adolescent, but someone who knows who they are, settles into an identity, is comfortable with that, and um, uh, has a relationship to the family, but is also separate from the family. Pretty complicated. And also learned in a practical way to support and guide their own life. Um, in the midlife transition, in the, in the 40s, when it hits, the transition is two things. One is that the individual realizes that youth is over, that they are no longer young, okay? And uh, the second aspect of it, okay, I'll, let me explain that, 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 um, that the body's beginning to decline and they feel for the first time that they don't have the same youthful strength and energy. And as part of that um, realization that youth is over is a very, very heavy realization on an emotional level that, that at that some point, if the average life is about 80 years old, that you are closer to dying than you are to being born. Now, anybody who's in the 40s and anyone who knows that people often live until their, their 80s, that's the modal age, uh, modal length of a life. They know mathematically, you know, if, the, if people live to 84 and they're past 80, 42, they're, more, they're closer to death than they are alive. Everybody knows the mathematics. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about getting that on an emotional level. Like, that is significant, okay? That is a big deal. Hopefully you're not driving, you know, fast when you, when you realize that. Better to do it like online at Vons or something. But everybody at some point gets that. And that's a big deal. And that could shake people up. And that could change things. Like, holy cow, you know? Um, so that's one aspect of the midlife transition, the physical... Uh, aspect of decline and realizing you're closer to death than you are to birth. Then the other aspect, which is rarely considered, is the idea that in midlife, most people realize the pinnacle of their career success and status in the society. And a lot of times, for a lot of people, that pinnacle is not the equal of the dreams they had for themselves in, in youth. Um, some people surpass it. You know, I'm sure Bill Gates didn't think that he would be Bill Gates now. Um, I'm sure uh, accomplished actors or performers when they were young could never have imagined, you know, what they became. Politicians or something may have come from humble backgrounds and risen to great heights of power and influence. So many people surpass their youthful aspirations, some equal them, but more people don't meet their full expectations and aspirations. And when that happens, and when you're younger, if you haven't met your aspirations and your dreams, you're protected. You're protected with one great psychological word, which is potential. I may be a screw up now. I may not be doing anything. I may not be, you know, doing what I think I'm able to do and what I hope to accomplish but I'm young and I have potential and I'm happy. I'm good with myself because in 20, 30 years, I'm gonna have it all together. 
okay? So you're insulated between the discrepancy between your hopes and your dreams and your desires and the current reality of your life. You're insulated from coming to grips with that because you have the protection of potential. But somewhere in life, and usually it's in midlife, not always, but usually, you run out of potential. And what your life is, is what it is going to be. And then, if it's not what you hope for, you have to come to grips with your life and yourself in light of the reality of who you are and what you accomplished. It doesn't necessarily mean your life is over, but it may be that it's different than you imagined. All right? Now, here's your engaged learning assignment that you should do. And what I'd like you to do is to um, write a description of your life when you're 50 years old. Tell me about your, your physical health. Tell me about your social situation. Are you married? Um, have you been divorced? Is it a first marriage? Do you have children? Do you have a dog, cat? Are, is everyone in your life healthy? Are you healthy? Is your uh, spouse or partner or children all healthy? Are they all happy? Are they all making a good adjustment? How about your parents and your grandparents? Are they healthy? Are they still alive? What about your work situation? Do you, do you, uh, have you achieved what you wanted to achieve? Have you gotten as far as your material situation, you know, where you want it to be? Go through every aspect of your life and describe what your life is going to be when you're 50 years old. And put it in a safe deposit box, in an envelope, which you like lick and tape so no one is going to look at it. And on your 50th birthday, go to the safe deposit box and read it. And some of you may exceed yourself. Some of you may reach and there'll be a congruence between accomplishment and aspiration. But some of you, quite honestly, won't. And that's the normative situation. And then what then? Okay, so um, can you embrace your life? Can you be satisfied with your life? Can you embrace life uh, with, with, in that situation? So that's your... In, in engage learning and you can if you're if you're uh, taking the class you know with uh, one or both of your parents you can also have a conversation um, um, you can have a conversation uh, with them about what were their youthful aspirations when they were your age how did they see themselves you know in in their the middle of the life how did they see where they would end up did they think about it at all uh, it could be a, a, good, a good conversation, all right? Now, there's a second uh, aspect of the midlife uh, transition, not just the futility. Uh, oh, no, I said it. The futility of youth and the potential. I did do both of them. And I'll, I'll close with how uh, an example of a, a man's life that I worked with in my practice and show you again how clinical psychology and studying of human development is it very nicely matched with um, uh, clinical work. And uh, it was a man who I worked with who was um, in his uh, mid 50s. And he came in to see me because he was quite depressed. He'd never been that depressed before. And as we talked, what I learned about him was that um, he was a. Uh, um, a college professor at a community college, okay, in California. And um, he, in, as a professor, you have a couple of ways of advancing your career. One of them is the way of research. 
you, you, you teach, of course, but you write, you do research, and you advance your career by getting grants and publishing books and articles and being invited to talk. And that's the way of research and scholarship to advance your career and its stature. The other way is the way of administration. So in, in, in addition to being an individual faculty member, you um, uh, go get on committees, you become the chair of the department, you become an associate dean, a dean, and then you work your way up as high as you can go. So it's the way of scholarship and the way of research, and, uh, a way of administration. Now, if you're in the community college, you don't have the way of scholarship because community college uh, professors basically teach and do committee work. They, um, they're not really researchers and, and, and uh, they may be scholars, but they don't do a lot of that because they have major teaching responsibilities. So my client, you know, was ambitious and wanted to grow in his career. And so he went the way of, um, of administration. He became chair of the department, he became uh, associate dean, he, did, he was on all these you know, prominent committees, coordinating community uh, college systems, uh, campuses across the system, so active and so prominent in this. And his goal and his vision was to become the dean of liberal arts at his community college. That's what he wanted. That would be a full career to him. And about a year before I saw him, the existing dean decided to retire, but strongly recommended someone else rather than my client to be his heir, uh, replacement. And that shocked my client, who thought he had a very favorable relationship with the dean and the dean would recommend him. And secondly, the person that he recommended was 10 years younger than him in his mid forties. And then he knew that that person would not step down before his career was over. And therefore, even though he had a good respected job, he no longer had a career because a job is a noun and a career is a verb. A career moves, a job is something that you have, all right? And so it was devastating to him and he sunk into a deep depression because his whole life had pointed to that moment. And we had to process that. And I drew some of the things that I'm talking to you about, about that midlife transition and about potential and about our hopes and dreams and reconciling life with things that may not conform to those youthful dreams uh, became a, a big part of the conversation. And so you see the merger of lifespan and clinical site. Okay, this was a, a long lecture. Um, but um, I think an important one. And um, uh, in addition to this, the, the PowerPoint that I uh, had on this is, is already posted. I will upload this uh, uh, video to uh, Brightspace sometime tonight. Um, and you'll have that. And uh, you also have a couple of chapters to read in, in Midlife. All right. Um, so have a good day and I'm signing off now.